on the cuff. Uh-huh. On the other cuff. Hello, Scopa de la Mia Vida. I cannot carry all of the time. Ah, uh, your quality is slipping. Uh. Yeah, have some peanuts. Don't worry, I'll pay for them. When John Garfield died of a heart attack at age 39, 10,000 mourners, mostly women, showed up for the funeral. Local papers wrote the mourners off as a pack of curiosity hounds, but film scholar Robert Sklar sees a more intimate connection. The women, he says, were paying homage to the Mickey Borden of four daughters, with whom the Depression generation of urban adolescent girls had fallen in love. This character, insolent and self-pitying, marked Garfield's debut with Warner Brothers in 1938. It made him a star overnight. It was a surprise for Warner Brothers. They anticipated critical kudos for Garfield, hyping him as the talented star from the stage hit Golden Boy, but they were unprepared for the way his debut as supporting player in a cast of veteran character actors would inflame female moviegoers. If they'd known, they would not have killed him off. In hindsight, it's easy to see how necessary Garfield's Mickey Borden was to the success of Four Daughters. Based on a Fanny Hurst story about the romantic coming of age of a band of musical sisters, it was a superficial suburban little women until Garfield showed up, 35 minutes into the movie, to amp up the cynicism and darken the plot. I'll get it. Is this? It is. Come in, Mickey. I've been waiting for you. I've been struggling with this opus for days. Say, so you're going to find this arrangement right up your alley. Mmm. Rug on the floor, smell of cooking from the kitchen, piano, and flowers. It's homes like these that are the backbone of the nation. Where's the spinning wheel? Shut up. Did you miss the train? I ignored the train. Thumb my way up. Why, I gave you more than enough for the fare. Well, I bet the five dollars on a horse I could have bought for seven. You had a lovely name, Felix, and I can't for the life of me remember. Another newcomer, Jeffrey Lynn, was scripted to get the girl, Anne, played as a stubbornly upbeat tomboy by Priscilla Lane. Mickey's job was to sidetrack Anne on the way to the altar and then step aside in the name of true love. In this case, by speeding off an ice-slicked road in a blizzard. Thankless role fulfilled, he would not be returning for the sequel. Or would he? Scrambling to cash in on Garfield's appeal, the studio devoted 1939 to raising Borden from the dead, first in a hastily conceived follow-up called Daughters Courageous. Same daughters, same suitors, different names. Garfield, now a cocky but inept confidence trickster named Gabriel Lopez, was promoted to romantic lead, top build above the Lane sisters. The planned Four Daughters sequel, Four Wives, in which Priscilla Lane would at last be united at the altar with Jeffrey Lynn, was now reimagined with the late Mickey Borden, sidetracking Anne yet again, this time with collateral plot complications from their ill-fated marriage, an unexpected pregnancy, and his still unfinished composition, which Anne plays obsessively in a kind of Mickey-haunted stupor. Meanwhile, Warner's reworked one of its trademark Fugitive from Justice films, Dust Be My Destiny, into an improbable romance for Garfield and Lane. The story of a love you'll long remember, of a boy trying to escape the past, and a girl risking everything to follow him. I don't care what I've got to go through. Please don't leave me here. You'll have to take an awful lot of chances. I'll take you. I'll love you. By this time, the mostly male cast of film reviewers were tired of Mickey Borden. A New York Times review of Dust Be My Destiny pretty much sums up their boredom. We detect signs in Mr. Garfield of taking even his cynicism cynically, and of weariness in Miss Lane at having to redeem Mr. Garfield all over again. It's a wry and perfectly understandable reaction. It is also out of sync with the paying public. 
What was it about this packaging of Garfield and Lane that so fascinated female audiences? It's easy to explain it by pointing to the good girl's attraction to the bad boy and her maternal compulsion to redeem his better nature. You think they let me win? Who? Hey. The fates, the destinies, whoever they are that decide what we do or don't get. What do you mean? They've been at me now nearly a quarter of a century. No let up. First they said, let him do without parents. He'll get along. Then they decided he doesn't need any education. That's for sissies. Then right at the beginning, they tossed a coin. Heads, he's poor. Tails, he's rich. So they tossed a coin with two heads. Then for the finale, they got together on talent. Sure, they said, let him have talent. Not enough to let him do anything on his own, anything good or great. Just enough to let him help other people. It's all he deserves. Well, you put all this together and you got Michael Bolgar. Bolgar? That's the name I was born with. I thought if I change it, I'd throw him off the trail. It didn't work. Sklar observes that Mickey Borden was the sort of man whose untapped genius needed only the right woman to kindle his self-esteem. And audience reactions suggested that many young women imagined themselves as candidates. This invitation to identify with the heroine as nurturer is certainly evident in all the sequels to Four Daughters, official or unofficial. The Mickey Borden character was an orphan, an outsider, unsuccessfully disguising with wisecracks his desire to be saved from his love affair with desperation and doom. And how to save him? Bring him inside the garden gate, feed him tea and cakes, surround him with surrogate family, domesticate him. But I think this housebound reading is a bit too simple, a bit too eager to imagine Garfield's fans as a pep squad of mothers in training. It ignores an important attribute of the female redeemer, agency. Mickey Borden's self-pity, his complicit wallowing in the specter of his own failure, forces Anne and all her later incarnations to look up from her passive role as one of four marriageable daughters submitting to the ritual of middle-class courtship. To look up, wake up, and act independently. Significantly, she acts to ditch the courtship ritual and leave home. Of course, in Four Daughters, Anne's decision is glossed as an act of reckless altruism. Sister Emma loves Anne's fiancé, and Anne must not betray her favorite sister, so why not leave the field open to her? Mickey loves Anne, and Anne pities Mickey, so why not marry him instead and live in a tenement? There is a presumption of error here. What was she thinking? And Anne must be returned to comfortable domesticity. In the end, we find her saved from her own bad judgment, happily swinging on the garden gate with her family-approved suitor. But audiences aren't so easily manipulated. When Anne elopes with Mickey, it's difficult for me to imagine female viewers ruminating over the virtues of self-sacrifice. I'd say they were vicariously experiencing the liberation of the nice girl from her safe, gilded domestic cage. Mickey, a character for whom life is an unfinished musical composition, seems the perfect subversive to loosen the latch and lure the daughter out of the kitchen, through the garden gate, and into his messy, uncertain outsider reality. In Four Daughters, the script contrives to make this liberation a bitter pill, almost pure deprivation with a lightning bolt waiting round the corner. But in Daughters Courageous, it is clear that Warner Brothers is trying to come to terms with the not-so-predictable expectations of Garfield's audience. This time, running away with the wrong suitor would mean aimlessly wandering the wide world, not dodging the inevitable lightning, but embracing unknown adventure. In the end, the daughter is not allowed to go, but there is no life-affirming ride on the garden gate this time. She's resigned to house and home, deprived of love and adventure. The ending is almost tragic. By the time Depression-era urban adolescent girls settled into their seats for a date with Dust Be My Destiny in fall 1939, Priscilla Lane's gilded domestic cage had degenerated into full-fledged prison. 
rescued by Garfield's Joe Bell from a household that is literally a men's work farm with a cruel stepfather as overseer, Lane's Mabel goes on the lam with her guilty until proved innocent boyfriend. They marry on the run, taking hasty vows on a public stage, part of a radio show promotion. They thumb rides and hop freight cars. When Mabel is arrested, Joe breaks her out of jail and they run some more. The Jerome Odlum story on which the film is based was inspired by accounts of the lawless adventures of Bonnie and Clyde, who had died in a police ambush five years before. But Mabel is no Bonnie Parker, just a good girl, a smart girl, a strong girl, determined to keep her man on the straight and narrow whatever it takes. This includes, finally, betraying him to the police so she can earn his acquittal with a tear-drenched defense of his humanity. His outside story is her story, and despite a contrived pontificating Robert Rawson script that exalts the middle-class dream, the story experienced from the theater seats is flight and more flight, with frequent pauses for ardent clinches in anxious corners. Garfield's fans were in love with a passionate vagrant. <laughs>